Last week, we took some time to um, look at a piece of scripture that's fairly familiar. And it's probably a piece of scripture that is familiar to most of us in this room here. But most of us as Christ followers don't go to that piece of scripture when we think about Christmas. When we think about Christmas. And yet, as we read that piece of scripture last week, we found very clearly that it told us the reason for this time of year. But it was amazing because we didn't read anything about Bethlehem. We didn't read anything about Mary or Joseph. We didn't read anything about a manger, about shepherds, a star, or even a baby. And some people might say, how in the world can you tell the story of Christmas without all of them? Well, when we read those first 14 chapters in John, it was very clear that John wanted us to understand the story of the birth of Christ. To understand the reality that it was a supernatural event. And yet he didn't talk about Mary and Joseph mangers, stables, stars, shepherds, or even wise men. He wanted us to understand the most profound truth that God himself, the great I am, took on flesh and became a man while yet remaining fully God. Catch that. God himself took on flesh, became man, and yet remained fully God. So today, we're going to go a little bit farther with that understanding to say, all right, because John tells us more about how this, these four words, the word became flesh, how these four words are profound When it comes to this reality of Christmas and this time of year. You ready to go a little farther? Okay. Have your Bibles with you? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. I love the Word of God. Father, again, we thank you for your Word. Use it to take us farther and deeper in our walk with you. Don't let anybody remember my words because they're kind of like fluff. But let us remember your words. We love you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Turn back to John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Again, if you're not familiar with the New Testament or the Bible, there's a table of contents. Go to that table of contents. Find the book of John. It's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to be in chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses this morning. Are you with me? Here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If there's a verse to memorize, woo, that's one to memorize. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. As we start off today... I want us to understand that John, the author of this book, gives us three very important truths, three pieces of reality that help us understand the Word becoming flesh. And today I want us to focus on those three important truths, which take us back to verse 1, where John starts off and he says, in 
the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. We'll stop right there and ask ourselves, what beginning are we talking about? What beginning are we talking about? Now, you might recognize those words in the beginning because they take us back to where? Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, oh good, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, the beginning that we're talking about here, the beginning that John is talking about, is the beginning of the beginning. Before anything else existed. He's taking us back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, before anything else existed, there was the Word. In the beginning, before anything else existed, there was the Word. Jesus was already in existence before anything else came into existence. That's profound. Let that sink in. Jesus was already in existence before anything else came into existence. Let that sink in. That's important because we have to understand that Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is not a created being being. He existed before anything else ever existed. Before anything was, Jesus already was. Before anything was, Jesus already was. A word to help us understand that is the word pre-existent. Pre-existent. You got it? Before anything was, who was? Jesus, Jesus was. He, he was. He was already in existence before anything else came into existence. When God said, in the beginning, ooh, and here comes everything. Where was Jesus? He already was in existence, wasn't he? Pre-existent. Now I want to take you to a couple of Greek words. In the beginning was the word. The word was is a Greek verb. And the word that is used here in this verse is the word ami. Am I? A-M-I. Which means to be. It's a verb meaning to be. But in the Greek it also has a bigger meaning which means to be in continuous existence. So in other words, John is telling you and I, Jesus has always been in existence before anything else came into being. Before anything else existed, Jesus came into existence. Now, John could have used another Greek word, which I have there. Geonomi, which means to come into existence. Well, he didn't use that because Jesus had never came into existence, did he? Did he? No, because Jesus has always been in existence. Before anything ever existed, who existed? Jesus. Did he ever come into existence? No. no. Jesus never came into existence. That's why John says, in the beginning was, am I, the word, to be in continuous existence. Jesus existed before anything else existed. That's what got Jesus in trouble sometimes. Because remember when he was talking to the Pharisees and he told them, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisees go, wait a minute. We know you, Jesus, and we know your father. How can you say before Abraham was, you are? Abraham lived thousands of years ago. How could Jesus say that? Because Jesus is what? pre what? Pre-existent. Pre did he exist before anything else existed? Yes. So did he exist before Abraham existed? Yes. So Jesus could say, 
before Abraham was. I am. That's exactly what John is putting on the table for us today to understand how important this is. When we talk about the Word becoming flesh, the Word is Jesus, and Jesus is pre-existent before anything else ever existed. Now, you know why that's important? Because some of my friends who are Mormons and some of my friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses tell me something completely different. My friends who are Mormons tell me that God, who we worship, who they worship, used to be a man. That this God that we worship was a good Mormon who got to the point and level that he was so good that he became a God. And that this God created, because he has a spiritual wife, he created spiritual children, he created Jesus and his brother, Lucifer. That is so wrong. That's like putting chocolate syrup on a baked potato. That's wrong. You just don't do that. It is wrong. That is such a lie. Jesus never was created. You've got to let that sink in. That is reality. He has always been. He is pre-existent before anything like that ever came into being. Jesus came into being. So Mormons teach a wrong doctrine. They say the same words, but they mean something completely different. My friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses, they tell me something completely different. They say Jesus used to be Michael the Archangel. And then Michael the Archangel, who was created by God, became Jesus. That's wrong! That is as wrong as having a fully carpeted shower. That's yuck. That's a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus was not created. He wasn't Michael the archangel and then became Jesus. He wasn't created by God who had spiritual children and Lucifer is not his brother. Jesus is the Word become flesh. And John wants us to be clear that the Word become flesh has always been. He was and always has been pre-existent. Make sure you know that. Write that down if you don't know that. But John goes a little bit farther and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The word was with God. That word with means in the original language face to face with God. In face to face communion with God. So Jesus is pre existent, right? Is he part of creation? No, he is before creation, isn't he? Before time ever came into being, Jesus was. He was, and he was with God. God, which means anything before time is eternal. Before ever time happened, here's Jesus. He is eternal. He's been preexistent. He has always existed. Still with me? Is that hard to wrestle with? Jesus has always been preexistent. But John takes us to another truth that's important for us to understand. Not only was Jesus pre-existent, not only was he with God, but the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. He was coexistent with God. Coexistent. 
What does that mean to be coexistent? I want you to wrestle with this a little bit. Think about this. Jesus is distinct from the Father, isn't he? He is distinct from the Father. He's having face-to-face communion with the Father, and yet he is fully God as the Father is fully God. He's with God, face-to-face communion with God, yet he is fully God just as the Father is fully God. In fact, the book of Colossians says that Jesus, in Jesus dwells all the fullness of deity. In Jesus. He's preexistent. He's been there before creation ever existed. He is coexistent. He is God. So remember this. Jesus is not an attribute of God. The Word is not a message from God. The Word is not an emanation of God. The Word is not a creation by God. The Word is God. Did you catch that? Now we're going to stop there for a minute and let you wrestle with the heaviness of that. Jesus is pre-existent before everything created. He is co-existent. He is separate from the Father, but He's the same as the Father. He has face-to-face communion with the Father, and yet he is God, just as much as God is God. Which is kind of the beginning of some of the mysteries of the Trinity, isn't it? To understand that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. They're all God, but yet they're distinct. Now, how does that work? I don't know. But... That's who God is. He is beyond our comprehension. And yet, John is writing here in his word, I want you guys to understand the supernatural reality of this time of year. Understand how supernatural it is that the word has become flesh. Because the word is preexistent to time, space, and matter. The word is coexistent, has always been. And yet, we go even a little bit farther. Because as we think about this, we think about those four words. The Word. Who's the Word? Jesus. Jesus. Was Jesus created? No. No. Has Jesus always been? What's a good word for that? Pre-existent. Okay, He has always been there. He is God. Co-existent. He is face-to-face with God. Even though He is distinct from God, He is still God. Woo! I'm already sweating wrestling with that. Okay, But yet, John in his letter takes us a little farther because he wants us to understand all that this means, the Word became flesh, and he says these words. In Him, who's Him? Jesus, Jesus, the Word. In Him was life. In Him was life. Now, when you deal with this expression, in him was life, you're really starting to deal with the substance of deity. The substance of deity, of being God. Because when you think about pre-existence, you're talking about Jesus and his eternality. He has been there eternally, pre-existent, right? When you're talking about pre-existence. When you talk about co-existence, you're talking about his equality with God. But now when you start talking about this reality that John puts on the table, in him was life, you're talking about Jesus' self-existence. Self-existence. Self-existence is critical. Now I want you to think about this. Most people don't think about this question. Here's a question for you. What does it mean to be self-existent? Think about that. Don't necessarily answer out loud right now, but think about that. It's a deep question. What does it mean to be self-existent? Okay. Again, I want to take you to the original language. I think this will help us a little bit. The Bible says, in him was life. There's two words that John could have used. The first one is a Greek word, 
B-I-O-S, which means physical life. And there's a word zoe, which means all life. John used the word zoe life. In him was life. In other words, Jesus was not just physical life that we would understand. In Jesus is all life. All life. Life is who Jesus is. He did not develop life from some other power. He did not receive life from some place. He possesses life as an essential part of his nature. Did you catch that? Jesus didn't receive life. God didn't go, here, Jesus, here's life. You can have this. He didn't gain life from someplace else. Jesus possesses life as an essential part of his nature. He is life. He is life. Think about that for a minute. That's huge. Life is in Jesus. Think about back to the beginning of time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? When God said, and everything came into being, life happened, didn't it? Where did life come from? From God. Because God is life. Jesus is life. That is his essence. Life is in Jesus. He didn't get life from somewhere. He didn't receive it. That's his essence. That's why he could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why could he say that? Because his essence is life. That's who he is. That's why Jesus could say, I'm the resurrection and the life. Why? Because that's who he is. That's his essence. He is life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Life dwelt among us, that we could behold His glory. Life. That's who Jesus is. The pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent Word became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could behold his glory. Isn't that amazing? John is painting that picture. He goes, catch this. And then he says something else. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. In other words, when Jesus came, the light went on. Whoosh! And all of a sudden, sin was exposed. Nobody could hide anymore. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. Now, for those of you who have been in our Old Testament survey class, we've studied a little bit about God and what we would call the Shekinah glory. You see, in the Old Testament, when God appears, so many times he appears the Bible says it's the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord shone about. And when we see God appearing, think about this with Moses. Moses is in the desert. God appears. How did he appear? The burning bush. Light. When God goes up, or when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, there's a cloud, and it's full of light. Light. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, his face shone full of what? Light. Because he's with God. Throughout the Old Testament, you see the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, the light of God shining. And here John says, I want you guys to catch this. The supernatural reality in him was life. And the life was the light of God. The Shekinah glory was shining through Jesus. Why? Because who is he? Who is he? He is God. Jesus is God. Pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent. Nobody created Jesus. Why? Because he's always been. Can you, I mean, 
You know when I sit and try and comprehend God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, always being, never having a beginning, never having an end? My mind sometimes just kind of just short circuits because I have to figure out, well, where was the beginning? Because all I know is beginning and end. I don't know no beginning and no end. But isn't that amazing? God has always been. And won't it be amazing that one day you will always be? Isn't that amazing? That you will live eternally. You will always be. There will never be an end to you who put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. John says, I want you guys to understand how supernatural this is. And he paints this picture, and he tells us all about Christmas. He tells us all about this time of year, and yet he never talks about Mary or Joseph or a manger or a stable or a star or shepherds. He doesn't even talk about a baby. But he opens up the reality of the supernatural truth of what this time of year is, that the Word became flesh. And I wanted to take you to John chapter 20, and this is where we're going to close this morning. The 20th chapter of John. We were just in John chapter 1. John chapter 20. And we're going to go to verse 30 and 31. John writes this whole book for this reason. Listen to what he says. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John says, you got to catch this. The Word became flesh. And I'm writing this whole book with all the details about the Word becoming flesh, the pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent Word, so that you can believe in the Word. And if you believe in the Word, you can have Life forever. See, a lot of people believe in a manger. A lot of people believe that there were shepherds and that there was a star. A lot of people believe that wise men came as Jesus got older. They believe that there was Mary and Joseph. But the question isn't whether you believe in them. The question is, do you believe in the Word? The Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you believe that Jesus is the pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent Word, God in the flesh, who came, born, died, rose again, so that anybody who puts their faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Redeemer, as John said, can have life forever. So I don't want anybody that has ever been a part of this family, who's ever heard me speak, go, well, nobody ever told me how to get to heaven. I don't understand what that means. I don't want anybody that has ever heard me say, well, Kim never told me. Because if you're sitting here today as clear as day, the most profound truth in the Word of God are those four words, the Word became flesh. And the Word became flesh for Jonathan, for Cleo, for Mel, for Percy, for Randall, for T, for Barbara, for Kim, for Daisy, for Mark, for Henny. The Word became flesh so that anyone who would trust in Him, who would believe in Him as Savior and Redeemer, could have all of their sins forgiven. And as John said, they could then have life 
forever. Forever. Now I know as we sit in this room, there's some of us in this room that are dealing with some medical issues that we look at our life and we go, we're terminal. We're going to die. Do you know that everybody in this room is terminal? Everybody in this room is terminal. We're all going to die. We're all going to take our last breath. If you take your last breath and do not believe that the Word became flesh, and do not trust Jesus as Savior and Redeemer, the Bible says you'll spend your eternity separated from God. You will be in solitary confinement, in hell, not with your friends, not enjoying company. You will be in torment. You will be wishing and thinking and remembering as the rich man said in Luke 16, please send someone to tell my brothers about this so that they don't come here. You'll be knowing, you'll know about friends and relatives. You'll know that you heard about Jesus. You'll know that you didn't have to be there, that you could actually be in heaven. And you'll also know that you'll never get out. And you'll have to live in that state for eternity. And I don't want anybody to be there. You don't have to be. Today, just double check. Just make sure. Look in your heart and say, do I know, do I believe that Jesus is the pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent Word of God who became flesh, who died on the cross, shed His blood, rose again, And I believe, me, Kim Nielsen, I believe, not just in my head, but in my heart, I believe that He is my Savior and Redeemer. I trust in Him. I don't trust in my good works. I don't trust going to church. I don't trust being a nice guy. I don't trust giving money. I trust in Jesus. I trust in His account. That is what is key. There is no other way. So thankful for this time of year. This time of year is not about Santa. It's not about Rudolph. It's not about Frosty. It's not about the Grinch. It's about the time in the history of mankind when God himself left heaven, took on flesh, became fully man, fully God, died on the cross, shed his blood so that people like you and I could live eternity. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today and you've trusted Jesus, rejoice. This time of the year brings rejoicing. The Word became flesh. If you're here and you don't love Jesus, today's the day you need to put your faith and trust in Him. Don't play games anymore. Don't think that, oh, you'll, you'll do that when you get older. You don't know. You don't know when driving around that curve, that semi's going to come and the party's over. You don't know, like my friend who's on the way to San Francisco and a person crosses the line and hits them head on. You don't know when that's going to happen. But what you do know is that now is the time of salvation. Today, you can put your faith and trust in Jesus. The Bible says, confess your sins, believe that Jesus died on the cross, ask him into your life, bow your knees before him, trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our morning today. Thank you for your word that is so true and so clear about this reality, this time of year that the word became flesh. Without you, Jesus, where would we be? There is no hope. I have no hope. My righteousness is like a filthy rag. Our righteousness is like a filthy rag. But because of the blood of Jesus, you can see us as white as snow. Thank you so much. Pray for each and every one of us here who is Christ followers that we will grab this truth, live it out, believe it, trust you, let people know that there's hope. If there's anybody here today that has never trusted you, Jesus, Take the blinders off their eyes right now, please, so that they do not end up in eternity in hell, that they can be with you forever. If you're here today and you have any question, am I a Christ follower or not? Am I going to be in heaven or not? Right where you sit, man, you get on your knees and your heart and your mind and your thoughts and you say, God, please forgive me. I am a sinner. And I believe today I can see clearly That Jesus is the pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent Word of God who became flesh. And today, Jesus, I ask you for forgiveness of my sins and my sinfulness. Come into my life. I give you my life. I put my faith in you. Just tell God that. 
most important decision you can ever make. Father, we come before you. Thank you again for this day. May the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you are the word made flesh and that you dwelt among us so that we could behold your glory, glory is of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. May this be a powerful week for all of us as we prepare and get closer to this celebration. We love you. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, all God's people said. Amen. 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 You guys have a great and powerful week. See you next week. Oh, Barbara just reminded me. Next week at 9 o'clock is breakfast. We're going to have a great Christmas breakfast. So come for that, and then we'll have church. Good. You're dismissed. Have a great week.